On episode 256 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn how to mentally prepare for your matches with Dr. Larry Lauer. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of the show. This is your host, Mirban Iranshad, and on today's episode, I have for you an interview with Dr. Larry Lauer. Uh, For those of you who may not know, Dr. Lauer earned a PhD in science, exercise, and sports psychology from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He was previously the Director of Coaching Education and Development at the Institute for the Study of Youth Sports at Michigan State University. Dr. Lauer was also an assistant coach and mental coach for Michigan State Men's Tennis, helping the team reach the 2013 NCAA Tournament. And Dr. Lauer was a sports psychologist consultant for USA Hockey's National Team Development Program. He currently co-hosts the Compete Like a Champion podcast with Johnny Parks, and he is a mental skills game expert for the USCA National Campus's athletes there. So um, really cool to have Dr. Lauer uh, on this week's episode. We actually recorded this one a little while back, and Dr. Lauer, in addition to talking about how to mentally prepare for your matches, answered some of the audience's questions. This was actually a live stream. So I really hope that you enjoy this one and gain a lot of value from it. I certainly did and took a lot away from it in terms of how to prepare for my matches, and that's one big thing that a lot of people do wrong, uh, including myself in the past and even sometimes now. Uh, You know, no one's perfect in that regard, but uh, if we stick with the plan that Dr. Lauer is going to lay out for you, then you will maximize your chance of winning uh, and playing well first and foremost. So, all right. So with that, uh, and without further ado, here is the episode for this week with Dr. Larry Lauer. Hey everybody, welcome to this special session of the summit. This is Mirban Aranshad again, and I'm here with my friend Larry Lauer. And uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to have you on, Larry. Uh, you know, you're down at the beautiful USCA National Campus, which I can't wait to be at in uh, in May. So that'll be really great. But uh, yeah, first of all, thanks so much for taking the time to t- talk to us today about the mental game and how we can prepare for our matches. And uh, yeah, how, how have you been? I've been well and, and really appreciate you having me at the summit and the invitation to speak about preparation. And it's one of my favorite topics, but, uh, you know, it, it's certainly something that can help all players, uh, whether you're a pro or an adult player or a junior. So definitely looking forward to this, but uh, I've been well and busy with tournaments and uh, in yeah. training camps and everything. So, yeah, season's well underway, as, as we know. So. Great, great. And just as some some background, um, and you, you do obviously a ton of great work with some great players. Like, who do you who are you uh, working with uh, when you're down there at the USA's uh, national campus? Yeah, so now it's it's uh, really heavily focused on juniors, junior players, and some transition pros. So we have a lot of our young best juniors will come in and visit and go home. So, um, you know, we have we have players like Reese Brantmeyer, Ashlyn Kruger training out of the campus. Um, we have, uh, as well on the guys side, we have a number of players that have been there, been coming more in and out, but, uh, you know, so there's, there's a bunch of players. When people ask me, you know, who have I been working with? I say pretty much, you know, I've been involved with a, a lot of different American players. I can't really speak to specific people, but, uh, most of the American players over the last, you know, 10 years have had some involvement with because, you know, they come through the training center and we do uh, presentations. We do uh, obviously individual consults and we also, you know, just provide that support, whatever they need. So uh, some players I work with directly, some I don't, but uh, certainly it's it's fun and, and we're, we're doing our best to, to make a difference. So, yeah, I love it. Yeah, you definitely, definitely are. It's uh, so important as we, you know, see on the tour, uh, uh, a lot of the trials and tribulations people go through, and it's mainly the mental side, I'd say. So, um, and as far as like preparing mentally for matches, I don't want to take too much away from your presentation that's coming up. But I mean, uh, how? I mean, how often do you think adult play? And you know, I don't know how much you work with like adult recreational players. Probably not too much, but you know, how much of that is an issue? Do you think like how, how underutilized is that, and how much can we gain from actually doing that? Oh, I, I think that the uh, 
preparation for matches is vastly underutilized by adult players. I played uh, league tennis uh, when I was in Michigan and Michigan State University, and we had a team and played for the 4-0 team. And when I showed up, you know, great guys and, and some really good players, but they were just a group of individuals that happened to come together and play together. But there was no real, you know, they had a Tuesday practice, but, you know, the way you do things uh, increases your chances so much in, in terms of your performance and, and just enjoying the performance, you know. And I think about, you know, why would adult players put more time into preparing? Because they're busy. They might be traveling from a pretty good distance, you know, in the car to play. Uh, if they're playing league tennis, uh, you know, maybe they're coming straight from work or being with mm -hmm. their children. So there's a lot of different reasons why we wouldn't really prepare. And again, I'm not talking about the preparation that, you know, if everyone's seen Nadal's preparation at the U.S. Open. They're like, that, that guy, that's the hardest workout of my year, his, his warm-up. But, uh, yeah. but you can do a few things that can really help you perform. So if, you, if you're willing to make the time, 10, 15 minutes, um, you can be healthier. Uh, you can start faster to your matches. You can enjoy the experience more because you're playing better just because you've loosened up. And, and we'll talk about some of the details of that. One of the, one of the things about that, Mirvan, is that people don't like to do it because, well, everybody's kind of hanging around and you're being social and you're talking. Do you want to yeah. be the person who's off doing their own thing, warming up, listening to music, stretching, doing a dynamic, shadow strokes, visualizing, all these things? Um, but if you want to get an advantage on your opponents, then you have to be a little bit different, and I think this area that you asked me to speak about is, is definitely one of those um, places where you can get a big advantage and, and improve your game. Awesome, Larry. Really excited to uh, to hear more about that from you. Just uh, say hello to a few people. Jay, look, hello from MoCo. That's where I am. Awesome. Uh, John, hello from a sunny day in Victoria, BC. Definitely wish I was there. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Al, hi from is. San Jose, California. Yeah. Uh, hello to you, Al. Uh, Raj, do you want to answer the th three questions? Yeah, there's three questions below um, this video as far as like where you're from and your level and your biggest uh, issue in tennis or problem. So feel free to post that below in that section or here. Um, either way works for us. Um, Jamie, hello again uh, from Philly. Awesome. Uh, Still Philly. Philly cheese stick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're a Philly fan, are you? I, I lived in Philadelphia for a while. I, I, yeah, I worked for Flyer Skates. I was a hockey director, believe it or not. I know oh. I'm on the, uh, the tennis summit, but uh, as a hockey <laughs> director back 20, 22 years ago, but a huge Flyers fan, Phillies, Sixers. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Oh, and very and cheese, cool. cheese take fan as well. Mm, yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Respect it. Respect it. Um, I'm in, uh, you know, Maryland, so I kind of favor the D.C. teams, but uh, good rivalries there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And Surf, Surferin, hello from sunny, good vibes, Stockholm. Awesome. Cool. Okay, Stockholm. Love nice. to see it. Love to see it. So, yeah, Larry, uh, I'll, you know, I won't blabber on uh, anymore for now, at least. So uh, I, I guess you have a, a cool presentation for us to check out. So, I mean, we can go to that if you'd like. Sure. I just wanted to share a few things you know, here today with, with our audience and some important ideas that I feel, you know, even if you can just do a few things, it can make a big difference in your tennis. So uh, this idea that why would we prepare for our matches mentally? Well, I think it's a way to get the best out of ourselves uh, and, and to find more consistent performances, which is we all want, even if we're not that serious, it's not fun to go and not know what player is going to show up, right? You know, am I going to yeah. be two five today or am I going to be four or five? So, <laughs> you know, nobody, nobody, and again, the U.S. system of rating that, but nobody likes that. So, one of, one of the things that I like to talk to our players about is, you know, this metaphor of entering the highway at the speed of traffic. And I bet our audience, some of them will remember Sammy Agar, I can't drive 55. Uh, this idea, you know, that you can't go this slow. He, he's got to go in the higher gear and he's got a speed. And I'm not recommending people speed. But the, the point is that when we start a match, we want to enter the speed of the match, right? So when you get on the highway, you don't enter the highway at 30 mile per hour because you're going to get run over. Someone's just going to come up behind you and smack you. And 
you don't enter the highway at 100 mile per hour because you're going to run over somebody, right? So you have to try to get into traffic close to the speed of traffic. You can't allow yourself five minutes to warm up to the speed of traffic because it's really going to mess up the flow. So you have that entrance ramp that you do that on. Well, to me, our warm up is our entrance ramp to the match. And we want to be as close to the speed of match as we can be when we start to match. Uh, this way you can start um, really giving that effort that you want from the first ball, striking the ball the way you want to, executing certain points, the patterns, strategies from the start. Uh, it gives you a big edge. And we know that if you can get the first break, you're more likely to win. I mean, that makes sense. So, you know, that metaphor of let's, let's start at the speed of traffic. Uh, and, and not wait to just get into the match, the flow match. I hear that. Well, I need to play a couple games. Okay, but that might be a couple games that you're now behind. You know, you're, yeah. you're down 0-2 and you're just starting to see the ball. So not necessarily the best move. But in, when we talk about pre-match preparation, we're talking about planned activities. So these are things that you do on purpose. They're done consistently and they help you reach your optimal performance state, okay? And that, if everyone on listening, watching this, that is this place physically, mentally, emotionally where you're at your best. And that formula is different for every single person. There are some guidelines, there's some principles we wanna follow, but as a player, you need to figure out what that formula looks like. What does it, gonna, what's it gonna take for me to play my best tennis? So your best source of inf information is going to be your past. Uh, when have you played your best and, and how did you get yourself ready to play? Uh, you know, so it's a bit of a kind of, you're it's kind of an experiment in some ways where you're trying to figure out what brings my best tennis out. Pros do this all the time as they're moving up the, up the system, right? They're learning about when they played their best, when they played worse, and, and what were the differences in the preparation? We're talking about that all the time. That's that's something that our our players, our adult players, can definitely take advantage of too. So, so what what do we mean by ready? So, I think ready is this place in general where you're present, you have great positive energy, uh, and and you're focused, you're committed to a plan. Uh, a strategy. So there, there's some goal that you have maybe. So when you come into your match, you know, how do you know if you're ready? Well, physically, okay, you need enough energy to be ready to, like we said, enter the speed of traffic. So you got to be warmed up. You got to be loose. The heart's got to be pumping blood. The muscles have to be stretched, all these things. Mentally, you need to be focused because if you're focused on what you're doing for dinner, or what people are saying on the sideline, or a fight you had last night, you're not going to play very good tennis, right? And, and again, tennis is way more enjoyable um, when you're present. And so having that present focus, right? And how do you create that? How do you get there? And finally, emotionally, uh, tennis is a very emotional sport because you're playing doubles, so it's a highly energized uh, version of tennis, or we're out there by ourselves in singles, and that can be quite emotional as well because we feel quite responsible for what's happening. Um, emotionally, are you in the right space to compete? And what does that look like? Are you feeling excited? Are you feeling uh, a sense of control? Are you feeling composed? Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you enthusiastic? So frustrated, angry. You know, where, where is that emotional sort of mix that you're at? And you want to target those emotions that you want to have more so than the others. Now, we don't have total control of our emotions, unfortunately. But we can do things to try to get us close to the right emotional mix as we go into a match. So, so when you think about being ready, think about it's not just physical. That's what everybody thinks about. It's also mental. It's your focus and emotional, that emotional energy that the feelings that you have going into a match. So physically, you know, to make this a little bit more concrete, you know, think about what temperature you want to be at when you're when you're playing your best. Uh, you know, if, if people say like Federer is cool, calm, collected, you know, maybe he 
he might think about this differently, by the way. I've never talked to him about it. But maybe he feels like he's at like 40 degrees and they're pretty cool, composed. And then maybe someone else is really fiery. Maybe they're like 80, 90. Maybe Nadal's there, right? I don't know. Maybe Serena's like 80. She's a very fiery competitor, um, you know, whereas someone else would be a lot uh, not showing as much of that. So that, again, is a very much a subjective individual thing. But what you want to be able to do is put a number to or a temperature to when you're playing your best. What does it feel like? Am I fiery? Am I energized? Am I demonstrating a lot of energy? Am I just cool, calm, and collected, going about my business? Who are you on the court? I, I see a lot of players have no idea about what their best energy looks like. They just are sort of going with the flow, riding the wind. Whatever comes, comes. And, and, and if you want to be that way, that's fine. But I feel like probably a lot of the people in the audience are looking for the edge. They're looking for ideas about how to be a better player perform more consistently. And here again is a place where you you can do that if you can find the right physical and emotional energy prior to your match. You get a big edge on you on your opponent. You're going to play better. So how do you do that? Well there's actually you know, see on the slide here you can search habits for tennis success, set the pre-match preparation plan on our USTA website. On there, there's a link to go to a worksheet where you can fill out some questions that will help you determine sort of your best match temperature and your worst match temperature. Give you a sense of where you're at with your energy uh, before before you play your best and when, you, when you're not playing your best. So hopefully, you know, those that are watching, you know, search that up, download it, fill it out. Um, maybe have a, a teammate or someone who knows you fill it out as well and then give you good feedback. Or maybe it's your coach that, that you hit with. Focus, so this mental preparation as well, you know, think of it as a, a, a funnel, okay? And the day before you play a match, you're thinking about a lot of different things. I don't necessarily think you should be solely focused on your match. But as you get closer to your match, you're starting to funnel in that focus. You're thinking of fewer things and fewer things. And this is an an intentional process. Now, pros will start that process probably a lot earlier than in a recreational player. However, it depends on the person and, and, and what they're able to do, what's going to make them successful. So, you know, when you when you play tennis the next day, do you like to think about your match the night before? Do you want your mind off of your tennis? How does it make you feel to be focused on your tennis? Do you get too anxious and worked up and then it's not good for you, or does it make you feel ready to maybe think about how you want to play the next day, the goals you have, that kind of thing? Typically, what we encourage players to do is to visualize the night before about their game plan, how they're going to play, and or to journal, take down in writing what they're going to do to cement that commitment and that readiness to do it. Same thing in the morning, uh, you know, again, how much you're going to do. As an as a adult recreational player, uh, you know, I don't know, but, you know, doing things like getting loose, eating certain meals, listening to music, um, these things can help you get in the right headspace and get that focus, start to funnel in. Once you get on site, again, it can be very distracting because you're with maybe you have teammates or people that you know, maybe you know your opponents that you're playing. And if you don't take that quiet time away from all the socializing, you might show up at the start of the match going about 30 miles per hour. Your focus is on things other than your tennis. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, as you can imagine, having a really good warm up. Is that that's a place where you really start to funnel in. So if you can get a warm up hitting with someone prior to your match, uh, that's that's a big opportunity really to start to dial in your focus, even if you haven't dialed in your focus before that. Seeing the ball moving, hitting the shots you want to hit during the match. I even suggest playing a few points if you can, uh, just to start to feel like you're really getting into it and you're exerting yourself and doing the things you do during the match. For example, you know, Yvonne Lendl said that, uh, you know, in, in the pre-match, he would hit a few balls, just wire them off the back fence or the wall because he was just kind of figuring out what he had that day. So he'd hit it as big as he could and then he'd bring it back in, bring it back into the court. And I always found that to be a, a great way to help you open up your game, your strokes, 
and then you 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 work your game back into the court. Obviously, you don't want to hit every ball out. So your warm up with your opponent is where you should have funneled all the way down to now. The only thing you're thinking about is tennis, uh, and specifically, you know, when you're warming up with your opponent, this is not a time to uh, try to hit winners. Obviously, that really upsets people, but it is a time to move your feet, um, really swing through your your shots, accelerate. And, and hit a good shot, you know. Don't get so caught up of the ball having to land in, more so than just doing the things that makes you successful when you play the, play the match. And then finally, like we talked about at first ball, to me, um, this is where you start kicking in your between point routines, but uh, you have a good energy. You're very clear on your strategy or your plan if you have one, uh, which I would greatly suggest you do uh, if you're looking to enhance your performance. And, uh, you know, you're, you're really uh, present and ready to go. All right, last well, Larry, couple. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, just about the, um, the night before point. I, I was wondering, yeah. you know, I'm sure that, um, you know, many of us may not even know, like, whether it's better for us to focus heavily on tennis the night before or not at all. So, I mean, would you suggest that we just kind of experiment, like, w- before a match one night, we, we were all in, <laughs> and then the next match, like maybe where we don't think about it at all and just kind of see how that affects us. Yeah, absolutely. That's a way to do it. And you might also get some insights from other parts of your life, right? Like if in your mm-hmm. job you have to present and maybe what you do in sales or marketing or maybe whatever whatever job, if it requires you to perform, maybe you, you can get some insights into how you prepare for that, right? Do you like yeah. to spend a lot of time the day before? I know it's not the same, but it gives you a sense of, you know, when you think more about things, do you start getting anxious or does it make you feel ready? Now, the content of that thinking really is the important part of it, right? Am I creating a lot of doubts and what ifs and worries or am I honing in on the things that I'm going to do to be successful? And this is where I was going to go with the next slide is that, you know, a great place to start, honestly, before the match, maybe even the night before, is to do some visualization or recreate in your mind uh, images of you playing successfully and focusing on these ABCs. Or these are the, the, the key kind of process goals or the how-to goals, how you're going to play, how you're going to compete. They're going to make you successful. And I think, you know, a lot of times – Players can overthink things. So maybe in the morning of your match, you might go through, write down a couple things you're trying to do, a couple ABCs, like I'm trying to, you know, get forward to the net. Uh, I want to make sure I'm setting up points to my forehand and and use my cross-court forehand. Uh, And maybe I'm thinking about, you know, just really being focused and ready for each point. So I give myself these simple goals that are in my control. These things I commit to, and it me a sense of uh, readiness, but also a sense that, okay, I have a plan. And when you have a plan and that's how you're evaluating yourself, am I doing these things? It creates a sense of certainty, which is a, like an antidote for anxiety. You think of where fear and anxiety come from. Fear and anxiety come from uh, uncertainty, what we don't know. Well, tennis is always uncertain, even up to the last point. So how do we create more of that certain feeling? When we draw our focus to uh, our process goals, our ABCs, I'm going to do A, B, and C in this match. These are things that are under my control for the most part. And if I do those things, I'm going to walk off the court happy and proud. So that's a way to counteract the anxiety that comes. Uh, And it also is a way to quiet the overthinking. So if you can hone in on, okay, I'm going to do these things. I see it in my mind. I write it down. Boom, period on the end of the sentence, I'm done. I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm going to move on with my evening. I'm going to move on with my morning. I've done my mental work. I don't need to spend so much more time thinking about it. Great stuff. So I don't know. Folks might be saying, well, how do you put this into uh, practically put this into into work? And, and I would say a few things, you know, get out your pen or your pencil, get out a piece of paper and just think about what are the activities that I do before a match that help me feel ready mentally, physically, emotionally, what are they doing for me? And, you know, 
once we know what that optimal performance state is, which you can learn more about in that worksheet I mentioned that's online, we can then start planning our activities to hit that optimal performance state. So my suggestion, whatever you do, keep it simple, all right? So you don't need to be Novak Djokovic with your preparation. Do two or three things. If you do two things now and you think there's one thing that would help you, add that one thing and see how it goes. I wouldn't add more than one thing at a time, probably. Be consistent with it. You know, one time doing it is not going to tell you whether or not it's successful. Do it over five matches. Do it over eight matches. See how that impacts how you feel on the court, how you prepare, how you start matches. Are you in control of your emotions? Are you able to swing out and execute? Um, see what that does for you. A big part of this is timing. How much time should you take to prepare mentally? That's up to the person, right? And so, you know, some people feel they need 30 minutes. Some people need 15. Uh, you know, it, it kind of depends on the person and, and what that is. So you go into this figuring out, okay, when do I need to kind of go to myself and get ready? When does my warm up happen? Typically, we like our warm up, you know, on the juniors, for example, to happen, you know, maybe it's happening. 45 minutes before the match, right? And again, there's some tweaking that goes on an hour before the match, depending on how much that person wants to warm up. Um, make sure the things you're doing are in your personal control. We're not talking about superstitions here. We're talking about things that you do that make you successful. So it's not about having to have your lucky socks. This is about making sure your rackets are strong, uh, that you have a game plan that your body's warmed up and loose, the things that you can do to make sure you're ready to play. Um, final two things, and we can talk more about this. Make sure you're checking in with yourself pre-match. Don't be unintentional, like, oh, da, 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 da. oh, time to play. That gets people into trouble. And you know, so check in maybe half an hour before, 15 minutes before. Where am I at? Do I, am I ready to go? Yeah, I'm good to go, great. Following my plan. And finally, you gotta be adaptable. Very important because things change all the time. As the players know, you get less time to warm up. You get more time to warm up. And I can talk about that more if you'd like. But you got to be flexible with those things. You got to know that whatever for whatever's happening, maybe my warm-up gets a bit messed up. I'm fine. I can deal with that. I can get into this match and be fine. So you don't want to create a rigidity here where, oh, my gosh, I have to have a specific routine that always happens the same way because you don't have that much control over it. Uh, you, again, you're not an adult where, you know, your whole life is planned around your matches. So, um, so you're going to have to be adaptable. He has to be adaptable too sometimes. You're going to have to be adaptable, uh, be flexible to deal with the things that, are su that surprise you, that changes, and know that you can still perform. Gotcha. And that's what I got. And cool. Cool. Um, and uh, appreciate that. That was fantastic. Um, as far as the... Um, check-ins like is that basically just um making sure that your planned routine is going as you'd like it or is it a check of like how am i feeling or what's the what's the basis of the check-in I, I think it starts with where am i at how am i feeling uh okay. you know maybe the the big one um is feeling a little flat or i'm feeling a pretty like hyper and maybe jittery right and where am I at in this emotional, physical energy and knowing where that state is and then where I want to be determines your strategies, right? So if I, if am I pretty jittery before the match and I'm nervous and I can't get my leg from stop bouncing when I'm in the car or I'm sitting and waiting for my match, okay, probably need a little less energy. Not that you want to have no energy, but you're probably beyond the amount of activation energy you need. So taking some deep breaths, some quiet space, maybe to listen to some slower music that calms you down, um, maybe have a laugh with someone. Those kinds of things can help you to lower that energy a little bit so you can calm and compose. If you're, if you're going in that check-in and you're feeling flat, like, yeah, I'm not even really thinking about my match and I kind of feel tired or lethargic, hey, warning sirens have to go off. Like, this, I might be down a set before I get into this thing. So go do a more vigorous warm up. Go do some dynamic movement stuff. Maybe use shadow stroke to really get yourself engaged. Uh, maybe listen to faster music. Uh, so there's some specific things you do based on where you find yourself at your check in. 
if it were me and when I was playing uh, playing tennis, uh, USTA league tennis, I would check in with myself maybe 30 minutes before. Where am I at? What do I need to do? And I might have a sense already, like I'm getting up in the morning, like I'm feeling a bit lethargic, so got to get up, get moving, get it, get it going, get some faster music on, uh, whatever I need to do uh, to get myself ready to go. Got it. Thanks, Larry. And uh, as far as the adaptability, I'm sure that you have, you know, different range of um, players where some, uh, as you kind of mentioned, like if something goes wrong, then they get pretty anxious and things like that. But I know yeah. you've mentioned that we have to be flexible. So for those players who are, um, you know, the first type where they get kind of rattled, I guess, so to speak, and when things don't go properly, like what advice do you have for them? Yeah, you know, it's it's about resilience and not fragility and understanding that things don't have to go your way for you to be successful. Um, you don't have to be feeling perfect. You don't have to have a sunny day with zero wind uh, or just slightly cloudy so the sun's not in my eyes or to have the perfect whatever it is, string job or, you know, and I think a lot of this comes back to the way you train the way you practice. And I know, look, I mean, I, I work with juniors and pros. So we do way more training. But if you are doing training, you're having practices, um, practice in the wind. Um, when you're a little tired, still go and play because this teaches you how to deal with a suboptimal uh, state and how to get yourself closer to your optimal state, right? How to deal with those things. So uh, so I think it's it's that. I think it's also being prepared for the, the things that might come up, you know, when someone doesn't show and now you're thrown into doubles and you were planning on just playing singles, uh, but mentally like, okay, like be prepared for anything, know that you can deal with it. Um, and, and at the end of the day, and, and a lot of this advice is, is what we give to, to our pros and our juniors, because they're constantly dealing with a changing schedule. Uh, you have to be prepared to, extend your pre-match and be okay with that, you know, to stretch it. Maybe there's a space in there where you relax, you kick back because the match before you is going long. And then you just know when the score in that match before you, as you know, uh, when it's time to really start gearing things back up, where I'm going to go move around, maybe do some shadow strokes, maybe listen to music again. Uh, maybe that's when it gets to midway through the second set, right? And I start firing things back up again when it's been a long match or I've been waiting. And then you also need to prepare to shrink your preparation time. So sometimes you maybe you arrive late. Uh, maybe uh, you're going on before you realize, right? There's typically not, you know, none of these not before times for adult players. So you just got to play when they tell yeah. you to play typically. So um, being able to shrink that preparation knowing what the most important uh, movements in the warm-up are for you, uh, also knowing where you can cut back on things. Uh, maybe you don't need to have the 15-minute, uh, you know, stretch. Maybe it's going to get knocked down to five, you know, and you still are okay with it. Um, maybe your warm-up's a little shorter, but you still get through the most important things. So when you, when you practice these things and you mentally prepare for them, when the surprises come, you're like, Okay, I'm kind of ready for it. I, I knew this would happen at some point, so no big deal. If you don't mentally prepare for it, then it's a big deal when it shows up. Oh, I can't believe we got to go on the court. I'm not ready. Well, you know, this is yeah. going to happen to you if you play tennis. So, 100%, Larry. And uh, I've got one more question for now because I know we have audience questions. Um, uh, obviously, never me, but w what if we have, let's say, like a USC match or a tournament match and, you know, traffic or whatever, we're just – we, we leave late or whatnot. And then we get there like right when the match, you know, is going to start. And like, for a lot of us, we have like some adrenaline from, <laughs> you know, driving yeah. to the match and all that. So there's obviously do not do this, but if it happens, uh, I mean, what should we be doing? And I imagine something on the mental side to at least calm down some. <laughs> yeah. So, cause you know, that feeling of being rushed is, is one of the big things that can take away from the performance. Right. And, yeah, I've experienced that in grand slams with players when hmm. maybe the, the bus to the site is running behind hmm. or there's a lot of traffic and people are freaking out. So I, I 
think that in these cases, when you don't have that much time, do some breathing, um, calm yourself down, take that time to pause and be like, look, I'm good. I'm here. Going to be all right. And then maybe, maybe again, you know, all of your warm ups going to be in that warm up with your opponent. So then focus on moving your feet, exerting yourself, just getting into the flow of hitting the ball, right? And, you know, maybe if you can, you can visualize a little bit the way you want to perform. But if you've done some stuff beforehand, maybe you visualized in the morning, the night before, then that arrival might not have the big effect on you because mentally you've already done some of your homework. So, uh, but it, it's, it's not easy for sure. And I don't like to be running behind for things and get, you know, nervous or upset about it. So you really got to be aware of, of your emotions, remind yourself you're going to be okay, breathe, maybe in that sense, you would like to be optimally ready, but you're going to need a couple of games to really get into it. And, and, and there is where I'd say, Hey, just take care of your serve, right? If you can, just hold your serve, you know, do the best you can. If you get down a break, you know what, these matches are long. There's always a chance to get back in it. So, uh, but definitely not not the best situation uh, for sure. Yeah, love it. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Larry. So we'll go to some questions and comments. Let's see where we left off. Tom, hi, I just listened to Milan from Shanghai Clutch. He's all in. Yeah, that was definitely a good session there. Um, Raj Greenville, South Carolina. Awesome. Three, five biggest challenge is irrelevant thoughts that have nothing to do with my tennis mat. So what do we do there, Larry? Okay. Well, you know, I think the mistakes that a lot of people make, I'm not saying Raj, you make this mistake, but we try to fight our thoughts. I shouldn't be having that thought. Stop having that thought. And that just gives it more energy. What I would encourage people to do is to accept that you're going to have some irrelevant thoughts. You're thinking about what you're doing later that evening or a work project or whatever. Um, this is normal. Your brain likes to bounce around to different things. So my suggestion would be to accept that monkey brain that likes to fly around and think of different things and yeah. then get it, get it under your control by taking a breath uh, and then focusing your mind on, okay, this is what it's about. And if you're doing those ABCs, right, you wrote in your journal like the three goals that you have for the match, you can go back to those three things. You can visualize them. But this is disciplining your mind to focus in it, to funnel it in. Um, distraction is normal. All of us are distracted a lot in this crazy world. Uh, but being mindful, having that quiet space and practicing, going into your mental gym every day and spending five minutes doing meditation, mindfulness, breathing, visualization is training your mind to focus itself on one singular thing or into a smaller focus, if that makes sense, to zoom it in. That is a skill. And if you don't practice it, uh, that muscle atrophies. You don't, you're not as good at it. Just like if you don't go in the gym and hit the weight. So, um, so it, yes, in the moment, uh, be accepting of those thoughts and really refocus back on what's important uh, and use your breathing to help you kind of hit that reset button. But if you're practicing that kind of skill every day, mindful breathing, visualizing success, um, you're going to get pretty good at refocusing away from those irrelevant thoughts. So when they show up, they're really not going to hold that much power over you. Whereas now maybe you know that they distract you from what you're trying to do and they can affect your performance. So they end up being a bad thing when they show up versus just, ah, my brain misfiring. No big deal. Boom. Zooming in. Breath. Visualize. Self-talk. Here we go. I'm going to focus on moving my feet. I'm going to grunt from the start of the match. I'm going to hit this ball high over the net. Off we go. Yeah, love it. Love it. Thanks, Larry. Let's see. We've got Jamie. Per the three questions, so 2-5. Um, can't seem to get bumped despite exclusively playing 3-0. Hmm. Uh, biggest issue is putting it all together, competing well in matches. So any advice on that, uh, putting it all together and competing well? Well, that's that's a big question, right? Um, putting it all together. I think, you you know, talk to, to someone who's knowledgeable about tennis, a coach, uh, a teammate and try to get their feedback on what they see. It seems like maybe you haven't been able to identify 
you know, what it is that's keeping you from bringing it all together, right? Uh, but I would look in all parts of your game. You know, physically, are you holding up in these matches? Are you able to move the way you want? And again, I, you know, I don't know people's conditions and all that stuff, but, you know, physically, mentally, are you focused on, again, the ABCs, some strategies? I would focus a lot on tactics here too, typically, because, you know, people say like, yeah, I, I practice well, but then I get in the matches, I don't play the same way. Anxiety, pressure, and decision-making. If you're, if, you're, if you're in good shape and you can do the running that's necessary, then uh, how, how are you dealing with your anxiety, your stress, and these are interrelated, what kind of decisions are you making? So if you can learn how to take your strengths as a player and turn them into advantages. So let's say, you know, Jamie, your forehand's really good, right? Or how are you building points to your forehand? Are you hitting serves that gets more ball to, balls to your forehand, right? Um, or are you making choices that really undermine your strength? You know, sending balls into the backhand corner right away, and then you're in a backhand cross-court rally. So I'm not going to go deep. I'm not a tennis coach. I work with tennis coaches and players every day. I know enough. But look at the tactics and see if you're working towards your strengths, exposing your opponent's weaknesses, or you're actually exposing yourself. I, Mirabon, I see that often where players don't play in a way that allows them to be successful. They hit the ball too flat. Now, again, there's differences in styles here. Uh, we're not talking about pros where everybody plays a lot of spin these days, but um, most everybody. Uh, but nonetheless, if you can do some things that make your opponent uncomfortable and are working towards your strengths, that might be a way to start getting it going in matches. But you really, you really without knowing more, um, you got to take a look at all areas of your game and, and where do you think that, uh, you know, it's falling short, why it's not coming together. So, mm -hmm. yeah, self evaluation uh, is key of your strengths and weaknesses for sure. Uh, let's see more questions here. Oh, good one. Um, Jay, look, my challenge is learning to be competitive instead of cooperative when it matters. I was trained to be nice to the opponent by not really challenging them. Any thoughts okay. on that? Wow. Okay. Yeah. That that's different than the Lauer household where we basically <laughs> fought every time we played sports as kids. But um, uh, <laughs> yeah, we would get cool. into that's it. That's good. But yeah, well, it was okay. very competitive. But uh, no, I, I, that's great. I mean, what great character, but it might not be helping you in the sense of really, you know, what they, they talk about, like getting dirty and digging in and taking it to your opponent and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And we have to understand that when we do everything ethically within the rules to perform and beat our opponent, we're making them better. And if you were to play me, I would want you to bring your game because yeah. that's going to force me to play better. So I think a lot of times, you know, players think that, okay, I don't want to be, you know, too fired up or, uh, maybe I'm not going to hit certain serves because, you know, maybe it's, you know, not cool or again, depending on your level, that matters a lot and what level you're playing, but to be competitive is to say, okay, in one way I'm making my opponent better by really bringing it. And so, you know, if someone says you like, why are you trying so hard? That that's on them, right? Why are you trying, you know, and I've had people say that to me like, well, I have a standard of the way I want to play and either you bring it or you don't. And that's on you. So, and I know that seems a bit rough, but that's what I believe. I think that the, the other thing is that you're also competing with yourself. And so being competitive can be, okay, I want to try and hit, you know, 60% of my first serves in this match. Um, I want to raise my level. So that can get the juices flowing, right? Where you're competing with yourself. So setting goals to, to, perform. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, creating positive rivalries, one, ones where um, you really are pushing other people to be better by you being your best and, and, and having fun with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with that. I think being competitive is, a, is an awesome thing. Obviously, you need to be cooperative, cooperative often, but being competitive, trying to beat someone um, is, is part of life. And and, you know, 
there's times to do that. And fortunately, tennis is a place where we can do that in a good way. Obviously, we do it with respect. We do it with sportsmanship. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a good thing, I think, to be competitive. So you have to change your mindset about it. Set some competitive goals. Uh, play competitive games in practice, you know. Like play games where, okay, we're playing a four-point tiebreak. Here we go. It's on. And, and you know what? If you lose, you buy the other person lunch. You buy them dinner. Whoa, okay, that might get the juices flowing. So there's, there's things you can do to really um, encourage this part of yourself to come out. I really love that, especially the point about how, um, you know, by being more competitive, you're helping the other person, you know, get the most out of their game as well. I mean, the, you know, when I play tournaments and, and lose, that's when I'm learning the most, um, mm -hmm. you know, on average. So, yeah, uh, great stuff there. Thanks for the question. Let's see what else we have here. Um, great question uh, so far. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the timeless mantra, wherever you are, be there. About presence, yep, hundred percent. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, good Very reminder. Good yeah, yeah. Let's see. A comment. We're excited about summit and how improving my number one struggle is. I want to win championships, have fun and enjoy. Yes, I'm um, sure you will if you keep improving and uh, putting to practice what you learn about, including today with Larry. Um, Jay, look, I'm a very cold competitor. If I could be considered one and calm by that measure, all right, that's good. It's good you know yourself. Yeah, that's um, that's good. I mean, again, you know, people demonstrate their energy in different ways. Um, some exhibit it outwardly a lot. Others, they have a lot of passion on the inside, but they're not showing it. As long as you're in control of your responses to what's happening, um, where you're you're making good choices, you're making decisions, you're able to think clearly about what you're trying to do on court and give that good effort. You know, some can look very cold and, and meticulous. And others are, you know, fiery and look spontaneous, but there's a method to that madness. So, yeah, great stuff. Uh, Jamie, uh, my improving my number one struggle would be is I'd like to see how good I can really get. So that's a good uh, comment. How do you deal with um, kind of uh, maximizing potential, like on the mental side, like any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So I think, you know, trying to you know, kind of situate myself here with the audience because when we work with juniors, we look at all parts of their mental game, right? And, and identify strengths that they have and areas we want to improve. And then we, and, and we get them maybe at 12, 13 years old and we just start teaching, teaching, teaching in the classroom, taking it to court, giving them feedback on court, doing mental drills on court um, and building up their skill sets and their perspectives uh, and how they perform in, in matches. So I would say, you know, there, there are things out there that you can take. There's uh, mental toughness questionnaires. There's uh, other questionnaires out there, surveys. You can do essentially what they call performance profile. You know, we used to do this a lot uh, where we'd say, okay, you know, we'd have a, a basically if you took a dartboard, right? And we'd say, okay, on the outside, each one of those pieces or those sections of that dartboard or that piece of pie, uh, what, what are the qualities mentally that one would need to perform at a high level? Confidence, composure, uh, toughness, determination, resilience, right? Aggressiveness, competitiveness, okay, whatever you think those qualities are. The other way we do it is say, okay, take your favorite player and what qualities do they demonstrate? Put them on the outside of that, each piece of that pie and that pizza pie or even dartboard, each section. And then um, take a good hard look at yourself and rate yourself on how you're doing on those. Because at the center, that bullseye, um, if that's worth one point and 10 is worth, you know, is the best and that's at the outer edge, um, you know, how would you score on confidence, right? Um, what what score would you give yourself? Is that something that you're pretty strong at or is that something you need to work on? And you can go through your game and your, your mental game and look at different uh, characteristics and skills and, and see how you're doing. You could also, again, always great to have someone else give you feedback to so you get a coach that you work with do it or a close friend um, who you play with help you fill it out as well that might give you some feedback. Um, and then you identify 
I always think it's important to identify your strengths and try to find ways to maintain and improve those or use those more. And then find those areas that need improvement. And then um, there's a ton of information out there, of course. Uh, you know, there's many good books. Uh, Jim, Jim Lehrer's books uh, are, are great. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're looking for tennis specific things, um, we have our USTA Mental Skills and Drills Handbook that I was a lead editor on. We have a lot of mental skills drills in there. And also in our Compete Like a Champion uh, podcast uh, that we're doing, we're now going through certain drills and talking about how to work on uh, the mental side of serving or returning. And we're going to get into returning pretty soon. So, so there's, there's things out there. Um, you know, that you can, you can look at to help you identify, you know, what, where, where your challenges are and then start to come up with a plan. So. Excellent. And yeah, I just put in the compete like a champion podcast link. Uh, that's actually a link to Apple podcast, but I mean, if you just search for <laughs> the podcast, yeah. you'll find it on all platforms, I assume. Right. Yep, so, it's out there. Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Great, great work on that, uh, by the way. So let's see. So Jayla, kind of a similar question, I suppose. Um, but how can one transition from cooperative friendly play to competition where you must take advantage of any advantages and mistakes by the opponent? So I don't know if you had any additional thoughts, but. Um, mm. Yeah. yeah. Jayla is on this topic. So I, I would say, again, you know, as long as you're aware of the goals in, in the practice, so let's say you're in practice, and maybe you're trying to get 30 in a row and you have to cooperate in that drill. And then you progress to a, a baseline game. But to me, knowing the purpose of the drill will tell you if you're supposed to be competitive or cooperative. And also, to me, in a good practice, you obviously it depends on what the coach wants to work on. But often you're going to go from more cooperative work to competitive work where now you're putting it into point play, you're putting in situations where you are trying to, to do something to expose your opponent, to set yourself up. So, I mean, that's how I would look at it. If I'm, if we're working on things, it's more cooperative. Uh, I'm sure there's still times in point play where it is a, a lot of cooperation, maybe if you're playing only on one side or, or whatever, but um, nonetheless, I think that it's important to realize what the goal of of the drill of the game is and allowing that to dictate um, you know, just how competitive you're going to be. So, Yeah, great stuff. Um, so Chris has, uh, Christopher has a question about uh, related to overload, which I can remember you're, you had simple on the slide there, but yes. when playing a match, uh, how many areas of my game should I focus on? Okay. Uh, you know, I give you, I'm going to give you a couple different answers here. You know, in terms of like our short-term memory, we can hold seven plus or minus two things right hmm. here at the front of our brains and, and pay attention to them. But that might not be optimal for performance in a tennis match. So I would suggest, you know, I've talked about those ABCs. Uh, there's a couple of things that are almost like turnkeys for the rest of your game. That's how you want to think about it. What are the things that if I do them, other things happen automatically. Mm. So if I move my feet and I'm physical, probably a lot to do with like my strokes is going to fall into place if I have good technique. Right. And so I'm looking for those turnkeys. What are the things that are going to open up the other things without me even thinking about them? The other way to look at this, uh, Christopher, is that you have strengths, you know, things that you've mastered potentially in your game. Those aren't things you need to hold on to. Right. So if your forehand is something that you've mastered, you can hit it in the dark. Um, you can hit any kind of ball you want. There's really no need to think about it. Now you're just looking to use it tactically. Right. I'm just thinking about how to use this weapon to my advantage. So I would I would keep it down to two or three things that you think are critical. Um, one of them might be something that you're working on. And so, therefore, it's something you're going to try and work on during your match. And the other two might be things that are key things that when you do them, you're successful, maybe like your strengths. Um, that's how I would answer that question. It's a tough one because focus, um, you know, you you can only focus on one thing at a time. But our brains are really good at jumping from thing to thing to thing. And we can yeah. do that to a point, 
but you still have to focus on the ball. And if your mind, you get caught up on thinking of too many things, you lose track of this yellow ball, and that's where your focus has to be when you start the point. Thanks there. Yeah, that, that, that quote about um, doing the one thing that unlocks the others, I, I'm trying to remember what book that's from. Um, I, I read that, I and know. I know that Tim, Tim Ferriss had mentioned that on his podcast. But, yeah, that's, that's a great, great uh, principle there. Um, let's see, Jamie, it's always harder to control – certain things playing away matches including tournaments than home matches mm. like space to step away or early access to courts for a warm-up so any thoughts on that and you talked about adjustability a bit yeah you you make the best of the situation and find ways to adapt versus complaining about it right because if we complain about it then it just it's not going to make us ready right and we're probably bringing down our teammates as well as we do that so Make the most situation, find another space. Um, if you can't have the typical warm up that you would like to have, you can insert things like visualization in, or shadow strokes instead and really take advantage of your match warm up where you're really moving your feet, hitting the ball, accelerating, and then just have a, a positive outlook, knowing and a resilient one that I can do this no matter what, I can deal with it. Yeah, yeah, that, that mindset is, is key. Uh, good stuff. Uh, Jay, look, can you warm up off court uh, in different ways? Definitely. What have you seen? I've seen so many different things. You know, uh, some of the things that I've, I've found would be pretty interesting and I think useful. You know, coaches are with their players and they're tossing balls to them and they're having to catch them and move small movements, right? So that, I think that's working on their vision. That's working on anticipating and reactions and getting to the ball. So I, I like that one a lot. Uh, you know, I, I also love to see, you know, when players are, uh, you know, getting physical in the, in the dynamic warm up. they're moving, uh, they're, you know, just being explosive, a few sprints, obviously after you're ready to, to warm up the body. Um, those are ways, you know, I, I me, to me, it's worked for me. So I know that this can work and the shadow strokes, where you, you find your own space, you have your racket, you imagine you're hitting the ball, forehands, backhands, you're moving your feet. You don't even have to make it look like a point where you're moving 10 feet to this side, five feet. It can be right in a small space, but just the fact you're bouncing on your toes, you're hitting, that can be a nice way to really start to dial in. I remember Justine Ennen doing that before the Wimbledon final. So, you know, I, I, I felt if Ennen can do it and it works, then I can do it because – She's way better than me, and I need to do it if she's doing it. So, <laughs> yeah, definitely a lot of ways, a lot of off ways to uh, to exercise off court and warm up. Sure. Um, let's see, Bruce, can you discuss coffee use slash avoidance pre match, time of day of match, peak and duration of caffeine effects on tennis players? So, uh, I know you're probably, I know you have a lot of um, accolades, but I'm, I forget if you're a nutritionist or not or dietitian. But yeah. I mean, what have you seen, and like, what's your experience with that? Yeah, I'm not going to get too much in the details of that because that's that's going outside my strike zone a little bit, and I haven't looked right. at that research in a while. But you know, uh, my general sense is to try and yeah, it's just to stay away from those things. Uh, one because we can get dehydrated, especially if it's in a in a hot environment uh, or human environment. Um, you know, I know that adults use caffeine quite a bit, coffee to stimulant to get themselves going. Uh, I would encourage a, drinking a lot of water uh, or things like uh, with electrolytes in them, sports drinks, um, but mm -hmm. mostly water. And that's about as far as I'm going to go with that. Um, I typically find that coffee use, I mean, you, you really don't uh, see players using that stuff. Um, they have drinks that are spe specifically designed for them, uh, for their needs, for their body. And, uh, and, and you just don't, they might have something in the morning because they want that pickup. Uh, but in terms of a pre-match, no, uh, it's not something that I would see regularly. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, Larry. Um, excellent presentation. We're enjoying and learning a lot. Many thanks for your efforts. No problem, you. Artie. Great to hear that. Uh, Guido Mendo, hello from London, UK. 
which uh, football team do you support? I'm curious. Uh, let me know. But uh, I play, uh, I always play worse, um, get nervous when people are watching. Any tips for that? Yeah, that's, that's a common phenomenon. And, you know, it's a matter of focus, right? Because the focus is on outside. And when we start focusing on other people, it brings judgment into mind, right? Am, do, how do I look as a player? Am I playing well? Do they think that I'm a terrible player, that I can't hit a serve or I can't return? So we start judging ourselves, become very self-conscious, um, which is going to be um, detrimental to performance, as, as, as you know. My suggestion is, number one, is to discipline your eyes. And it's actually something we practice with our juniors a lot. Where do your eyes go when you're on the court? Eyes go to your strings between points or to a back point in the fence. So you might pick out a spot in a fence or the wall that you're looking at. If you watch Djokovic between points, his eyes don't wander around. They're just, they're here at his strings and then they're up at the court. So number one, discipline your eyes because then you can remove some of the distraction of seeing people watching you. Obviously there's still the auditory, you know, sounds as well and some of you can't avoid when you're having those thoughts so then try to look at the crowd in a different way reframe it in your mind because you might be worried about what they think about you as a player reframe it to either a they're here and honestly in 30 seconds they're not even going to remember that i was playing tennis so and they actually probably on their phones, so they're not paying attention to me anyway. And we know that most people are so caught up in their own stuff, they don't even realize you're there. So, I mean, you can kind of take it to that extent, or you can try to think about yourself as, okay, like people are here watching. All right, I'm going to go show them what I can do and take uh, that positive slant to it. I'm going to show them how I can play and what I can do. But um, it's a very common thing. And at the end of the day, if you can ultimately discipline the mind where you have between port routines and you just control your eyes, your vision, go to your strings, go to the back fence, take a deep breath to quiet the mind. This is what we talked about the, breathe, the mindful breathing earlier, right? To quiet the mind, exercise that. Use mindful breathing, mindfulness a lot, for meditation as a way to practice quieting your mind. And then when you get in matches, it's not so difficult. Use the breathing to quiet your mind and then insert the focus you want to have, okay? Uh, focusing on the task at hand. All right, I'm going body serve, and I'm looking to move in and take a ball early. When you get really immersed and engaged with the strategy of the match, which to me is so fun, um, then then the other things start to, to fall off. Focus on your your peep, your, your fans, your, your entourage, your you know, TMZ, whomever it is, is following you around. Uh, you know, you stop, you stop focusing on them. You start playing tennis. And then those thoughts will intrude sometimes. Get into your routines. Accept your thoughts. Breathe. Quiet the mind. Go to the focus you want to have, the task at hand, the strategy. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Artie, uh, I'm, a, I'm a good player, but when I make a mistake, I keep thinking about that. How can I solve this issue? Thanks. Well, RD, stop making mistakes. It's easy, man. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. I, you know, this and this is like the the number one thing that we talk about. It honestly at the training center, which is funny because it's the same for everyone, right? Mistakes. I missed the ball. Well, I think first of all is an acceptance that no matter what you do, sometimes you're going to miss. I mean, if Roger Federer, who we might think is the best ball striker to ever live, can miss shots, I certainly am going to miss some shots. So there needs to be a level of acceptance that even though you're a very good player, you're going to make mistakes. I need to accept those. Also think about the fact that when you're playing a good competitor, you're probably going to make more mistakes. Know the differences between your forced errors and your unforced errors. And hopefully you know the difference. The forced are ones that they forced you and you're in a tough position and, you know, you missed it, but that's really, you know, they caused that to happen. Unforce is when it's a shot you typically think you would make and you miss it. Those are two different kinds of errors, by the way. So know that and also know that you're still going to make some of those errors. It's normal. 
normalize it. And the most important thing is you have a job to do, and that's to be ready to play the next point. So when you get in between points, you can, there's, I mentioned in answering the previous question, a way to refocus from the crowd. You can do a similar thing here from your mistakes. Okay, but there's also a, a, a visual way to do this, and that is to, if you're getting stuck on that mistake, see that mistake in your mind again. So I'm, I'm seeing a forehand going in that. All right, I, I'm already thinking about it, so I see it one more time. There it is, and it's really frustrating. Then I erase it in my mind. So I imagine, you know, taking the marker board and making it white, or maybe I'm making a chalkboard and making it black, or maybe... You know, now in these tech heavy days, I'm swiping it away, right? Whatever works for you. And then insert the visual you want to have. Imagine hitting that shot with a better trajectory over the net. And that is a way to kind of move on. We call it see, erase, replace, by the way. So you can do see, erase, replace. You can do something that I mentioned earlier that's more of a, a breathing and thought strategy, which is your um, uh, like a, almost like a breathe and believe, take a breath, quiet the mind, focus on something you believe in, right? Um, it kind of depends on you. You can practice both and see what you like more. Hmm. Love that. Thank you for that, Larry. Uh, great mm -hmm. question. Uh, I think I did skip one. Um, Brenda, some matches I seem to be in a funk, not connected with the ball, not moving well. I try to move my feet, focus on the ball, but the harder I get, the worse it gets. Any advice on getting out of that funk? Yeah, well, that's that's what we kind of call like our, our red light situation when we're talking about with the pros. Green light, you're flowing, you're good, you're moving forward. Not necessarily in the zone, you might be, but things are going well. Yellow light is a caution point where, okay, I'm starting to make mistakes. I'm getting nervous. I'm distracted. I'm emotional. I'm getting a little bit outside of my optimal zone. Do your routines. Get yourself back in the green. But red, red is when you're not performing well, where you feel disconnected to the ball. And again, think of it. It's a, mat, a matter of focus, right? And your focus is being drawn away probably from the ball to how poorly you're doing or how you're not doing well. So that's just exacerbating the situation. My suggestion on this, and I know you mentioned here in the question that you try to move your feed and focus on the ball and it just gets worse. Well, maybe we take a tip from uh, the old inner game of tennis here. Try to get in the flow. If, if people have read that book, that bounce hit strategy, or sometimes we talk about one, two, ball hits your side of the court, think bounce, you hit it, think hit. Try to release a lot of the thinking and just focus on playing the point. You know what, like Brenda, when you play music at practice or and you just kind of get in the flow, that's because you're not thinking as much. And so maybe, in the, I'm not saying this is the absolute solution because I don't fully know your situation. Maybe um, because you're trying so hard, actually focusing less on it and just having that mantra, bounce it, bounce it, or one, two, one, two, can help you to release a lot of this and just get in, in, in focus and rhythm with the ball. Um, another option is, is just your breathing and grunting, right? So as the ball is coming, breathe in, make contact. You, you can breathe out or a little grunt, uh, you know, just get, in the, uh, you know, get into that rhythm. That's why a lot of players do it. I know a lot of other people hate the grunting that's going on in the program. I totally, in the pro game, I totally understand that, but I understand what they're trying to do. They're actually creating a, uh, a rhythm, they're creating a, a flow, something to focus on too. So you can use that um, as well as a way to get your focus off of trying harder and then things not working for you to just finding a rhythm and being looser and playing. Got it, love it, thanks. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> love this one. Christopher, hey guys, practice gratitude. You're healthy, you have the opportunity and the ability co to compete, enjoy the experience. That works a lot for me, actually. Sometimes I'm not playing so well, and I think about how grateful I am for being yeah. able to play when others are, you know, you know, unfortunately suffering or having other, um, they don't have opportunities to play. So, I mean, that's that's a real good one. That's yeah. I mean, do, you, do you use that yeah. as well? Oh, yeah. I, personally, uh, with the athletes and coaches I work with all the time, um, it's, it's a big part of our mental practice, to be honest. 
I find that gratitude is a tremendous way to move our thoughts off of the outcome. And kind of what you mentioned there in some ways, you know, I really want to go and play well and I want to win. But man, I'm just happy to be able to go out and compete, right? How cool is it that I'm healthy yeah. that I can do this? And that has a way of switching off a lot of those needs for outcomes, the things you don't have total control over and putting the focus back on the joy of competing, the joy of being out there and hitting the ball. Uh, so practicing gratitude is great, as Christopher was saying, for your health. Uh, it, because honestly, it's working on your stress levels, your anxiety. It's lowering those things, making you feel more at ease. Um, that's that's tremendous. Um, I would say for anyone, especially like if you're in a high stress job, taking multiple times a day where you have quiet time where you can practice gratitude, maybe going for a walk in the woods, walk in your neighborhood. Those are great for your well-being, um, getting up and moving um, as well. But as we come back to what the purpose of this summon is, tennis, um, gratitude is tremendous. So just being thankful, appreciative of the opportunity to play with somebody else oftentimes washes away a lot of the concerns. It's not a foolproof strategy, but it's, it's pretty darn good. You still got to do some of the other things like focus on ABCs that we mentioned earlier, or how you're going to compete and, and just letting that be what's most important to you. If, if that's what you want, uh, using routines like breathing and then focusing on a, a strategy for the next point is a way to keep your focus during the match. The gratitude is an absolute, uh, that's, that's a big hit for me and, and something that everyone um, can use in practice. So in gotcha. different ways too, it can, it can be prayer. It can be writing things that you're grateful about. It can be speaking it to someone else. There's different ways to experience gratitude. So thanking someone at the tournament, right? So. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. Educator has a book uh, recommendation, the miracle of mindfulness. Hmm. Okay. I haven't nice read that one, one, Educator, so we'll look at yeah. that. By Th Fitch Nethan, I think. Um, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. let's, see. let's see. So, Jay, look, how would you deal with away courts or surface types that are unfamiliar? Mm. Yeah, you know, that's it's a great question. It, it's something that, you know, that our pros and juniors spend a lot of time working on. Obviously, they have the wherewithal to travel and be uh, able to play on other surfaces. Uh, nonetheless, it is an aspect of something to consider for the recreational player, uh, for the adult player. And I think, you know, maybe build in some times where you, you take a little road trip and you play on a surface you're unfamiliar with and have some fun with and get a feel for it, right? Because typically we don't think about this till it's the, the day before or the day of, and we're like, oh, crap, now i got to go play. I hate that surface, or I have no idea how to play on it. So maybe go earlier and just get a hit on it, get a, get a feel for it. Um, you know, that that's probably going to be the best thing you can do. Get there early and try to maybe see if you can get on a, cor a court earlier and extend your, your hit a little bit so you can come up with the movement on the surface, the way the ball is bouncing. Um, you know, I know for, for example, uh, and again, this is, might be apples and oranges, but our pros, if they're going to play in altitude, they're going to go a couple days earlier to experience the altitude and get comfortable with the way the ball's carrying through the air and what they have to do. So, um, so find a way. And, and if you can't, then guess what? Focus on what you can control your game, what makes you successful. Um, be accepting of the things that don't go your way. Your acceptance is probably going to have to be pretty strong on that day because you might get some bounces you don't like. It might be a lot of reasons to complain and doubt yourself, and that's where your mental game has to be sharp. So be prepared uh, to let the, the things that don't go your way kind of slide off your back through acceptance, through being non-judgmental, practicing mindfulness, and, and also um, – trusting in your strengths, you know, and, and problem solving that you can find a way. So, but it's, it's obviously a good learning situation. So at the end of the day, um, you're going to learn something. You're going to learn a lot about your game. Uh, and it's, that's pretty cool too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Larry, thanks for that. Um, 
Bruce, can you comment if you know if there is any role for the use of a backboard for pre-match preparation? So I know it's not on the mental side, I guess, but um, I mean, I would think it, w it could be a, a useful tool. Um, any thoughts on that, Larry? Yeah, you know, look, for, first of all, it's better than nothing, right? So if you don't yeah. have someone to hit with, use a backboard. Um, it could be a great way, again, kind of like the coach that's throwing balls to the player, could be a great way to get yourself loose and your your eyes engaged with the ball and and moving quickly so i like that idea um it's obviously not the way that you play tennis so um you're going to want to if you can get a hit with somebody else but uh, I, mean, I mean i think a backboard could certainly play a role in, in helping uh, you warm up get ready mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i agree Let's see, Proc, what is your mind talk like when you're trying to calm down before a match or when things you're, uh, or when your shots are not going well during a match? Do you have certain phrases that you say to yourself? It's a good one. Yeah, it is. Uh, I don't know. Those are like, that's secretive. Should I give those away? I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll you're going to have to Proc. charge for that. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I'll give those to you today. So, no, I'm just joking. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, you know, it, look, everybody's different. Um, actually, a couple months ago, some of our juniors, we had a, a, a team meeting about this. What are phrases that really resonate within you that, that have meaning to you? Like for me, you know, this whole sort of era of mindfulness, it is what it is, is a phrase that has helped me. Now, some people are like, eh, when they hear that, other people love it. So uh, when I say focus on the process, some people want to gag and other people are like that is like brilliant and everything in between so it's gonna could they're gonna be dependent on what resonates with you but um what we said earlier about gratitude is a big part of this and being appreciative for the opportunity uh, to play to be healthy is a way to help you calm down um when things aren't going your way or to calm down using breathing you know actually like to simplify all the talk, maybe have less noise. Honestly, I'm not trying to talk myself as much through it as I'm trying to breathe and quiet the mind and then focus it on one or two things, right? Like for all the noise that's going on, the things are not going my way. If I get physical and I move my feet and I make this a long match, things are going to get good for me. And so again, uh, you know, being able to get back to this simple, back to the important things that really work for you, your strengths, the things you've worked on is extremely important. Certain phrases, um, I've seen, you know, Mirabon, I'm seeing players posting, like, the, have you seen them lately on Twitter or Instagram or their their uh, their notebook pages, right? The pro players, yeah. like Rada Canyon had hers out after the US Open and recently, um, who was it? Um, that was the, the gymnast, Suni Lee. Uh, posted hers uh, uh so and we talk about that with the players like hey look at what these other great performers are are thinking about or want yeah. to think about during you know things like murray yeah so control what you can control right for some people that's like at the top of the mountain i i'm at another level plane of existence it's everything and other people are like that's just like an overused statement so find what works for you is what it is, control what you can control, focus on the process. Um, you know, I remember playing and being like, look, it's not about getting broken, it's about bouncing back, right? And one of the key things we always talk about is it's not about what goes wrong, it's about how you respond to it. And that one, to me, I love that one. Um, yeah. Because everybody is going to make mistakes, but if you remember that, it's about the response and the final thing, because I know this is almost getting like uh, just throwing stuff at the wall, but playing one shot at a time, you're like, yeah, no, no doll, Larry. Everybody talks about that. But talking to yourself in a way where if you miss a shot, that's one ball. That's one ball. That's it. I'm good. Yeah. That's one point. And remembering that, you know, you might play 120 points, 100 points in your match. One ball is not going to kill you. Now, one ball that costs you four points might because you're still focused on the miss. So yeah. remember what your most important job is, and that is to refocus and be ready to play the next one. 
One ball. One ball. Yeah. One ball at a time. Yep. Let's see. Educator monkey mind. Yes, <laughs> that is what a lot of us have. <laughs> For sure. Um, just got to refocus. Uh, oh, Gary. Gary. Yes. How do you deal with a play? Oh, you know Gary or? <laughs> no, I don't know. If I, oh, okay. Do I know you, Gary? I'm trying to remember right now. <laughs> Sorry, man. I might. But you just gotcha, you, gotcha. You caught me off guard with this question. Question. Oh, that's why you said, oh, okay, okay. I thought yeah, maybe yeah. you like knew him or something. Yeah, um, how, yeah how, as you saw, how do you deal with a player who makes questionable line calls? Mm. Yeah, see, th- we've been talking about this a lot in our um, USCA webinars uh, with ah. Dr. Sean Foltz emmons and, and Dr. Carl Davies about hmm. you know just some of the tournament stuff and, and how to make it a joyful experience. But questionable, how do you deal with a player who makes questionable line calls? Well, to me, number one, we have to remember that we might not always see it correctly. So, you know, we got to give people the benefit of the doubt. That's number one. Because we realize that even when the pros have had the opportunity to replay points, they typically were wrong when they challenged. I know there was a lot of times that it was using it to get extra time or they were just taking a shot in the dark because they had two left or whatever. But um, they're not, they weren't very good at overturning the officials. So, so often what we see is not what's actually going on. Just remember that. But number two, if you're convinced that their line calls are, are not good and it's working against you, then I would say um, take that as a source of empowerment. And what I mean by that is, oh, okay, you have to do that to beat me. Obviously, you can't deal with my game. So I'm going to bring you more of my game. Because mm-hmm. what happens is we get caught up on the calls. We start thinking about that instead of playing the ball, playing our game. We get worse because of it. And that's exactly what shouldn't happen, right? We don't want that to happen. We want to just move on. So if I can empower myself to play my game more, to be more determined to play my game, that's how I want to look at it. Um, dealing with players who make questionable line calls, obviously if, if it's becoming a lot of drama, and an issue, uh, if you do have an official there, you can call for an official like at a tournament. Um, but I think the one thing, you know, and I haven't always been great at this when I was younger, so I'm trying to give you advice that I also give myself. And that is, you know, the way you demonstrate your respect for them and for the game and for yourself by being calm and cool and collected and say, are you sure about that? Where was it? Okay, and then moving on. Um, you know, one thing I would never do for, for getting angry on the court, I wouldn't cheat people back. And I, I wouldn't get into that if I were you because that's just like an arms race because now you cheat. Yeah. They think you're cheating them. They're going to cheat you bigger. And it, it just becomes ridiculous. And it's not tennis anymore. It's no fun for anyone. So to me, take the high road uh, as best as you can. Um, focus on your game. Uh, maybe you move your targets in a little bit. That's something that you can do tactically so that uh, it's not so close and they're not going to make those calls against you as easily. But, you know, you know, without going to the extent of calling them out and, and starting a fight, uh, I think there's other things you can, you can do. Keep it respectful. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. Let's see, Tom, can you put in the USA link to the questionnaire self-assessment you alluded to? I mental prep also repeat ABC specifics. Um, yeah. Do you know the, the link off the top of your head? I was trying to find it, but I didn't quite find the worksheet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, let me try and snag that real quick. So as we're sure. talking here, but, you know, that, that yeah. worksheet's a it's a good one because and, and it's based on the old work by sports psychologist Terry Orlick. If you pick up the book in Pursuit of Excellence, which is one of the all time great books. I love that book. But uh you being, you know, able just to understand what's happening uh, to you during the match. Learn from yourself. And I think this, this questionnaire goes a great way towards helping you identify the questions to ask. And then you reflect on it. Then you spend some time thinking about, you know, what it is that, uh, you know, that you're doing well and what it is that you're not in these matches. This should take you to the, the page. And then there's a link on that page for that. Uh, questionnaire. So just so you know, uh, but that, oh, that link there will take you to the website um, where then when you get there, you'll see actually a picture of Ernesto Escobedo 
uh, and nice. in our article. And you go about halfway down and it'll say go here uh, for the worksheet. So and I'll take you to another page. Excellent. Um, Thanks a lot. Yep. Thanks. And then let's see. So a second part of, to this question is um, I uh, also repeat ABC specifics. Hmm. Oh, OK. Well, that, the A. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the ABC. So that's just the way of drawing your attention to the things that you can control, because if we focus on what we control, we have less anxiety, we have less doubt and worry, and we become more planful, more intentional in the way we play. So you want to focus in on, on the things that you're going to do to play well, instead of, I, I have to win, I have to break here, I have to hold serve. It's like, well, yeah, I want those things, and that's great, but what I'm going to focus on is, you know, could be something like going up for the ball on my serve, it could be um, moving my feet. It could be getting to the net. It could be looking to take time and space away from my opponent, moving forward, right? It could be many things. Trying to move all the points to my forehand because that's my weapon, right? Um, whatever, you know, things are going to help you to be successful in the match, these are like these little reminders, right? And so when we start to focus on them, we start to focus on our strategy and what we control. We start to worry less about the outcomes and, and also how we feel, right? So it becomes less about, gosh, I need to feel good when I hit the ball. This needs to be right to, all right, I might not be feeling well, but I can send that ball there and force my opponent off that high cross court to hit one short to me, and I'm going to step in and hit the open court. And, and that kind of stuff, I think, helps you get to another level because – it becomes less about feeling good and technique to strategy and, and playing chess. And, and that, you know, every one of you can do uh, because you play tennis, you can study the game and you can learn about it, right? You might not have a booming forehand, um, but you can find ways in the game to set yourself up for success. And that, that's what that is. What are the two, the three things that you control, process goals, how you're going to play, how you're going to compete, that are going to make you successful and focus most of your attention on that. So hopefully that helps, Tom. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. Uh, let's see, Tom, thank you. Uh, he, so the book I was thinking of was uh, The One Thing um, with Jay Papasan, or, you know, the oh, author yes. Jay Papasan and Gary Keller. That's a real good book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so great stuff. Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, let's see. Did I get to this one? Yeah, I think we did, right? How did, yeah, question of live calls. Um, yes. Yeah, we did that. Good, good, good. Um, Christopher, do you recommend self-talk during competition? Uh, yeah, I do, but in very limited ways. One, mm. one guideline is to go, you don't want to have run-on sentences. You want to have very focused, almost bullet points, right? Mm. In, very, in a very objective way, right? So I hit that in the net. Versus, okay, I must be the worst player on the planet because I work on this every day and then I come to the match and I hit it in the net and here it goes again and I don't know why I spend the money and spend the time and before you know it, you have to play the next point. <laughs> Discipline the mind. There is some self-talk that has to go on, but that is going to go on. So you want to actually determine what that is on purpose, like I mentioned with the ABCs, right? Like the formula is you play the point, you respond to the point, right? You're going to have thoughts about that point. Okay, I'm going to do my breathing to kind of let that point go, accept that point, and then I'm going to focus my mind on my ABCs, my plan. I might be thinking about making my opponent move, so I'm going to try to hit the ball more towards the outer thirds of the court. Great, I've got a strategy. That's what I'm focused on. And, and that's important because, you know, in terms we talk about the quiet mind being able to focus – being able to create a commitment between points allows your mind to quiet. Because we always think about, you know, the hat and the pulling on the shorts and all the things that players do to, right, to draw their attention away from whatever's going on. But the most powerful thing I find is that commitment to um, what you're about to do. And you think about it this way. If you're going to go to dinner, right, and you're hungry and your mind's going through the through the pages of, okay, which restaurants do I want to go to? What do I like? How much do I want to spend? What part of town do I want to go to? 
on and on and on and on. And then you pick a restaurant. And then all the thinking stops, usually, right? You're no longer going through the, all the different restaurants you want to go to. You pick the restaurant. I'm done. I'm done with all that thinking. You committed to a restaurant. You set the reservation. So then there's no more need to think about it. Think about your point play the same way. There's a lot of different thoughts that we're having. But if we can focus on a commitment, and this goes back to the one thing and the ABCs that we've been kicking around here for the last hour and a half. I can go to that thing that I'm going to commit to. All right, this ball's going wide on the serve, slicing it wide. Great. Then my mind can quiet down because I've made a commitment. I can go to the line, do my rituals, bounce the ball so many times, move my hat, do whatever I need to do, bounce around before I return. It's helping you to go from between points, you're, you go internal, right? You start thinking more. And we want to keep it simple, as I talked about. And you want to be able to move that to the external focus. How do I do that? Well, make a commitment to a plan that helps your mind quiet down. So then you do these little rituals at the end of your routine. That's drawing your focus to the external. I'm moving from in here to out there, which has to happen 100 times, 120 times during a match. And so we have to be really great at, at switching that focus, moving it out side of ourselves, committing to a plan in a very simple way, ones that we practice, ones that we visualize before the match, we wrote in our journal, uh, has, has a way of helping us quiet the mind. Mm -hmm. Love that. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. And there's finally like self-talk. Encouraging things are always helpful. Um, words of acceptance or non-judgmentality. I made a mistake. Yeah, it is what it is. Everybody makes mistakes. Time to move on. So we'll practice those kind of things in our self-talk, but you have to be disciplined with it. And again, why we do that is because um, if we don't give the brain a way to focus, it'll go where it wants to. And typically under pressure to what's the most uncomfortable. So that's why I need to give it simple places to go to. Mm. Mm, very powerful. Um, excellent. Let's see. So interesting one. Any tips for night tennis and not being able to see the ball clearly due to poor lighting? So is there any sort of mental game aspect to this that maybe we could <laughs> riff off of? Or <laughs> I should have my wife come on here. She's an optometrist. She could give us some advice. Oh, uh, but, cool. Uh, yeah, you know, that's probably a little bit outside my strike zone, but I'll take the psychological part of that. And that is yeah. uh, my tips would be play more at night so you get used to, get comfortable playing at night. Um, yeah. And when, you know, oftentimes we create these stories, these narratives in our mind that I can't do something or I'm going to play poorly because of this. You have to change that story, that narrative in your mind. So go practice under that lighting, um, really work on, you know, seeing the ball, right? Because a lot of it might just be stress due to the fact you're worried that you're not going to play well. So yeah. quiet the mind, use a lot of the techniques we've talked about here today and get the eyes focused on the ball. Try to see uh, the number on the ball, the writing, really try to, to lock in. Uh, you know, you'll see Novak go like this and open the eyes. You know how much that helps. I don't know, but um, maybe there's something to that. To me, I can talk about the psychological side, and that, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Um, cool. Let's see. A couple comments and another question. I think shadow strokes are better than backboards. Fair. Um, you know, whatever works better for you. Um, shadow strokes are great, though, 100%. Um, let's see. James Stan says fail again to feel better. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm with you. I, you know, I've done that a lot, James. So I'm glad you agree. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Right. Uh, Isn't that the way uh, of things. Yeah, that's the way. That's the way. Fail and learn. Uh, Gary, how do you deal with a player who doesn't give you time to get set before they serve? Hmm. Ah, Is there an see, umpire around? <laughs> yeah. Right. So Gary, you just keep taking me these other directions. I love it. So <laughs> yeah. Now, now we're it's about between points. So, but it, it's all preparation, right? I mean, it's preparation for the point. So, uh, how do you deal with that? Well, you know, obviously we're playing at the server's pace, but you do, you should have the opportunity to be able to take a moment to recover. So, you know, there is as part of it, they shouldn't be quick serving you, right, or playing that fast. So you should be able to have a moment. To me, you know, I can only speak to my experience with this, with the players. Uh, 
And that is what we've decided to do when players are serving fast and we're returning. We're going to try and slow things down by going for almost like a, a walk behind the baseline, almost like in a moon shape, and like a half circle. So we're not going to walk straight across the baseline to the other side because that just encourages that other player to play fast. Mm. So we're going to go behind, but we're going to keep moving because, you know, then if you do have an umpire, an official, they're like, well, the person's getting ready. They're coming over. So they're probably not going to ding you on that. I think that uh, where you get dinged sometimes is when you stop and you're tailing off and you, which to me, you know, is all good and do it if you need it. Um, but that's sometimes where the server gets a bit upset because you're slowing it down, right? So you want to be able to do what you need to be able to do for the most part as you move. So if you can take a breath, think about your strategy, uh, maybe slow down a bit as you take that breath. But you're kind of doing that half circle. So it, it looks like you're playing at their pace, but you might be slowing it down two or three seconds, five seconds. So, um, you know, it is, you know, we always talk about the battle for the control of the court during the points. But Rafael Nadal uh, has made it very clear there's a battle for the control of between points as well, the pace at which the mm -hmm. match is played. And he owns that. You play it usually at his pace, the way he wants to be played. And, and uh, so there is a bit of a tug of war that happens between players and how fast or how slow it's going to be played. Um, just try to do that respectfully. And I think the way I mentioned it here can, can be a way to do that. And I think it's yeah. okay to hold up your hand if you're not ready. You just yeah. don't want to be doing that all the time. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point about the battle in between points. I haven't really thought about that. Um, good stuff, uh, Larry. So I just want to ask you um, as well, just to summarize, I guess, in a way, but more of an action step question. Like after watching, you know, the presentation, which was fantastic, and then also – listening to all these uh all your answers from these fantastic questions like what what one action step would you have us do uh next to uh to start preparing better for our matches yeah so it's a great question i i honestly you know would start maybe you're filling out that that worksheet that we sent the link for to understand how you're preparing, create greater awareness around your preparation and figuring out what's the one thing you can do that would improve things. So I would want to figure out what is it? Is it something physical, you know, having a better dynamic warm up or just doing something to warm up? Is it the way my warm up is going, the way I'm hitting beforehand and being more physical? Maybe it's mental where I need to work on focusing, getting that tighter funnel as I move towards my match and moving away from people and having my 15 minutes alone to get focused. And maybe it's, uh, you know, um, emotional where I need to find a way to draw out some more positive or energetic, energizing emotions, like, you know, being uh, energetic, you know, enthusiastic about the match and grateful for the opportunity these kinds of things. So, so I think everybody's going to have different things. Try to find one thing. And, and start to work on that. And remember that figuring out what kind of preparation works for you is like an experiment. There's some trial and error, as we talked about. So go try some things. Give it that good college try. Um, and see, you know, keep working on it. See, make little adjustments, you know. To me, that's also fun. Hitting a tennis ball and the strategy of the game is fun. But also is figuring out how to be more consistently good at it. And there's a big part of this that happens, as we know, before the match. So Get interested in it, know yourself a little bit more, and, and set one goal uh, to make that a little bit better in whatever area you think will most help you. Fantastic, Larry. And then uh, just to let the audience know, I mean, um, is there any particular, you know, projects or uh, things that you're doing, things that are coming up, or, or anything that you just want you know, the audience to, to let them know about that or, you know, also where they can uh, uh, follow you and all that stuff? Yeah, well... I'm on Twitter, so, you know, at Larry Lauer, you can find me there. We have our Compete Like a Champion podcast, which you shared, so you can find all yeah. kind of our latest um, material that we're putting out there, as well as on our USTA player development website. We're sharing resources there. We also have a net generation uh, USTA webinars that we're doing uh, for, for juniors and, and parents as well, so if you have children that play. Um, 
we have our USTA mental skills and drills handbook, which is now 12 years old and I'm not ready yet to edit that thing. It's a, a beast, but uh, mm -hmm. you can find that at coach's choice or an Amazon. If you're looking for more of a reference book and, and, and drill based kind of things that you can do for your mental game. Um, you know, so those, those are different things, you know, I'm certainly, you know, my interests are continue to involve, evolve. You know, we're looking at different ways to try and simulate uh, pressure, maybe using virtual reality. So stuff hmm. that we're looking at as well. Uh, and we're looking at uh, cognitive training, you know, so there's different things maybe that we can be doing in those areas. And again, that's stuff that we're doing with players that are dedicating their lives to tennis. But, you know, there's some fun things that, you know, recreational players can engage in, you know, with, with cognitive training, which might also be good just for their well-being. Um, you know, you can get an Oculus headset and uh, go into virtual environments, stuff like neuro, working with neuro trainer. You can do cognitive training. It's kind of interesting stuff. Um, and I think pretty beneficial. Um, you know, we're, we're working a lot as well on, on mindfulness and breathing and just continue to expand what we know about that, uh, different forms of breathing. Some of the people on here might be aware of like Wim Hof breathing or yeah. any kind of breath holds. What, what's the science? Is there science behind that? How's that different from your rhythmic deeper breathing? So, we continue to study that and look at those things as well as, you know, how do we sort of take what we know and get it to the court. And to me, that's the biggest um, thing that we need to do is we got to continue to find better and better ways to help players get things from the classroom to the court, from the practice court to the match court. And that that's going to be continue a big focus for us. Awesome. Love that. Um, so yeah, definitely everybody go, uh, to and subscribe to compete like a champion podcast and as well you know follow larry um on socials and yeah larry i really appreciate your time um thanks so much for coming on the summit it was uh, really enjoyable and uh, Thank i know you. everybody enjoyed it as well so yeah looking forward to you know uh making content with you again in the future and then hopefully we can uh meet up uh you know when i come down next month so uh yes that would be that'd be great so yeah, thanks again. So th thank you, Larry, and thank you, everybody, for attending, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you, everyone. All right, I really hope that you enjoyed this week's episode with Dr. Larry Lauer on how to mentally prepare for your matches. And if you did, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review for the Tennis Files podcast, and you can do that at tennisfiles.com slash Apple Podcasts with an S at the end. Or just hit the review button in your favorite podcast app of choice that you use to listen to the show. I would also like to leave you with a quote, as I often do at the end of the show. And this one is by Michael Phelps. And Michael said, if you want to be the best, you have to do things that other people aren't willing to do. Uh, that's really motivating for me just to remember that uh, to achieve great things, you do have to put in the hard yards. And most other people are not willing to do that. So in a way, it's actually easier to attain certain levels just because no one else is going to put in the work. So if you do and you have a, a clear plan in place and the uh, passion to do so, then you will make it. So uh, love that one. Thank you, Mr. Phelps, a fellow Marylander uh, from Baltimore, Maryland. Alrighty then. Uh, with that, Thank you for listening. Really appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next episode of the Tennis Files podcast. This is Mirabhan Aranshad signing out.